Well, good evening. I want to thank the, um, the WMU for always bringing our attention to global missions on Sunday evenings. It is such a dire need around the world. And she mentioned there's some online resources you go to. I could uh, recommend to you the Joshua Project as, as one of those uh, resources that you can go to when they identify unreached people groups around the world um, and the enormous amount of work they uh, put into looking into those things. And um, even if we can't board the plane and make it there, we certainly can um, bow our heads and pray. Uh, for these. Um, so if you would, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I decided to uh, switch over to a New Testament passage for a little bit. We'll walk through uh, 1 Thessalonians and then, Lord willing, uh, we'll probably go back to 2 Samuel. Um, 1 Thessalonians there's some really great things about this particular book of the Bible. Um, as far as so its end times focus, uh, the, the Christian ethics or how we know what is right and what is wrong. We have a, a lot of strong theology uh, presented to us by Paul in this passage. And in the, in the opening passage, he thanks the Thessalonians for their genuine conversion, and he, in turn, the implication is that he's giving us some of these indicators for what a genuine conversion looks like. And so, for while he is giving them thanks, or giving God thanks, for these indicators, it can be an application for us to, to examine our own lives, to test ourselves, and see whether our conversion is one that is genuine. I want to begin our time together with an illustration, and I didn't come up with this illustration. I think I heard it from a pastor named Paul Washer first. But say that I came in today uh, for the sermon after I'd been graciously invited to preach, and I came in 15 minutes late, and I got up to the podium, and I began to apologize profusely, saying, oh, I'm so, so sorry that I'm late. You see, while I was on the way here, I had a flat tire and when I was changing the tire, a lug nut went out into the highway. And as I stooped down to pick it up, I glanced up. And there was a 40-ton log truck hurling right at me. And it knocked me down. But I'm here now. That's right. Hopefully you would realize that if I had made such a claim, I'm either completely lying we're completely insane because you can't be hit by something so large as a log truck and not be changed by that experience, right? You would be either dead or if you did happen to survive, severely damaged by this incident. Isn't the same thing true with the gospel? Isn't the same thing true with the conversion experience? You were once one way, and the Holy Spirit intersected into your life, and now you're a completely new person. You're born again. If you have gotten hit by a log truck, there would be some clear physical indicators, right? There would be no question that you had come in contact with something so large. So the question is for us, as far as spiritually, what are some of those indicators what are some of the indicators that we can tell that our conversion is genuine? What can we look for in a rudimentary, elementary, or, or basic sort of way as marks for genuine conversion? Paul notes these things in his letter to the Thessalonians. Look at Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for you, for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, 
loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful for who you are. We're thankful for this word that you've given us. I pray, Lord, that you would prepare our minds, prepare our hearts as we dive into these words, these, the scripture, that you would help us to be more conformed into your image and that we would do all things for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Look back at verse 1. I'm going to give you some setup as to this letter to Thessalonica. Uh, the first three words that we see in verse 1 are three names. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. So Paul is set out on his second missionary journey to kind of give you some background. This second missionary journey begins after the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. This council, you could consider maybe one of the first great councils of the church. And what they debate there in Acts chapter 15 is, what should Gentiles be required to do who convert to the faith? Should they be required to hold to the law and to circumcision? And the Jerusalem church decides, no, a Gentile may convert, and they just can't eat sacrifice with the blood in it, and they, can't, they have to abstain from sexual immorality. And these are things that you would think, well, hopefully, right? <laughs> hopefully that's the case. So um, at the end of this Jerusalem council, the, the church gathering together, they set apart Paul and Barnabas as missionaries to go out and spread the gospel, which is a good indication for us as to what type of government, because it wasn't the leaders that set apart, it was the entire church together, right? And this is one of our marks as a Baptist, as we believe in the congregation has the authority to govern the church. And so this is what they're doing there in Acts. They send out, uh, the, they lay their hands, which is basically saying, we approve of you to go out and serve as missionaries. Well, along the journey, um, he meets up with Timothy, and he also splits from Barnabas over some sharp division about an a individual named John Mark. And they have a division, supposedly John Mark shrunk back at one point, and Barnabas said, no, we could still have him. And Paul was like, no, we can't have him. And so they, they split. Uh, Barnabas and John Mark, they went down to Cyprus. And um, at this point, Paul is joined with Silas. His Latinized name is Silvanus, which is what we have in the text. Same person. Silas is the Silvanus who co-authored this epistle with the Apostle Paul. So they're about to head down south to Asia where Ephesus is. This is Asia Minor. We think of modern-day Turkey. They're about to head down to the province of Asia when they get a vision from God. And this is the Macedonian call. And so instead of heading south to Asia, uh, they head west. I had to think about it. You know, never eat something you want. West. They head west. Is that bad? <laughs> they head west to Macedonia instead. Okay? Um, so it's during this time that they go through Philippi. You remember any story about this? The Philippian jailer, Paul's thrown in jail, and then um, after this whole experience with the Philippian jailer, he announces to the city leaders, oh, by the way, we're Roman citizens, and the city's like, oops, and so they kind of shove him away. After that is when they end up in Thessalonica, and this city was a free city because they supported the right emperor in time past. When some emperors were battling together, Thessalonica chose the right one. And uh, so they became a free city, which had certain perks. If you're like, what is a free city? Here's, here's some of the things that they benefited. Uh, they could appoint their own leaders. So unlike if you, if you picture Jerusalem during this time point, they could not appoint their own leaders uh, because the Romans were afraid that the Jerusalemites would rise up against them. And so they put in Roman leaders. They put in the Roman army there. Well, Thessalonica, they could appoint their own leaders. The Roman army weren't paroling the streets in Thessalonica. They could mint their own coins, and they didn't have to pay nearly as much taxes as some of these other cities. And in response, these, these city officials, they deified the Roman emperor and started worshiping the emperor 
as a god. Now, this isn't something unusual of the day. Uh, the Romans constantly deified their emperors. They, Thessalonica, specifically, we have archaeological evidence of this. They minted a coin um, off of one of the sons of an emperor and inscribed it with son of the deified. You can almost say son of God, but not referring to Jesus, of course. It was referring to a, a Roman emperor. So anyone coming into the city making religious statements is by default making a political statement as well. There's no way around it. And you see, we, we assume in America that we can have our, our religious side of us here, our political side of us here, our personal home life side of us here, our work side of us here. We, we like to compartmentalize every single aspect of us. But in reality, what we see as far as God's world, there is not one square inch of this universe which Jesus doesn't say, mine, as Abraham Kuyper once famously said, right? So w when we think about us as Americans, everything we have to say either relates to God's truth and promotes it or takes away from God's truth and demotes it. And Paul, he comes into the city, he announces the coming of Jesus. Jesus is the king, not Caesar. Of course, you're going to start turning some heads at that point. Not all is well in this city. Why? Because the emperor that they were commanded to worship did not bring a perfect society. He was considered a god, but all was not well. People were plotting to bring him down. Even earlier emperors, they outlawed the practice of divination and astrology that was good because people were going to these astrologers and saying, hey, when is the emperor going to die? And so the astrologers were trying to figure out, based upon the patterns of the stars or the diviners, they would, they would cut open livers and look at the entrails to determine things. Kind of strange, right? So they were practicing all these things to figure out, when are we going to get rid of this emperor? And so these emperors, they'd say, no more of that. And so the emperors were not afraid to legislate religion, like kind of our modern mindset would be, right? We don't want to establish any religion here in America. Well, that was not the way of the Roman emperors at all. They were not afraid to establish a law in these regards. So the Jewish expectation for a Messiah was a military man who was going to come in and conquer the uh, wicked oppressors. A wide chasm in the city existed between the well-to-do and the poor. Those in the city, just as today, recognized that something was seriously wrong. It's, it's just as C.S. Lewis says, that pain is God's megaphone to the world to say something's not right. And of course, we identify that thing that's not right as our own sin. Paul and his missionary company enters the city with this very proclamation, the Jewish Messiah is here and he's here to conquer sin. He died to put sin to death and rose from the dead, ensuring his victory over it. And will one day return to establish his kingdom. And as you can imagine, this message made some Jews very upset. That's not the Messiah. The Messiah is supposed to conquer the Romans now. Furthermore, the city officials hearing this message think it's an announcement against the emperor. Well, if the emperor outlaws divination against himself, then obviously any other type of religious proclamation against the emperor has to be outlawed, outlawed sorry, as well. So they find the missionary team, Jason, a wealthy individual with whom they're staying. He gives the security saying that he would prevent this missionary team from causing any other problems. So, the missionary friends have to leave. Paul, Silas, and Timothy have no choice but to leave prematurely before they feel satisfied with this church plant that they had just begun there in Thessalonica. So the church isn't even fully formed and ready, and they're on their way out. And this, this entire narrative that I'm 
uh, rehearsing to you. It comes from Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 10. If you want to look up Paul, uh, Paul's journey in Thessalonica. However, even though they're so worried, right? This is probably why, one of the reasons why they're writing this letter to the Thessal- Thessalonians is because they want to ensure that the work that they had started, that God is going to bring it to completion. And isn't that so true, right? Philippians 1.6. And they get a good report from the surrounding cities about the faith there in Thessalonica, of the believers there in Thessalonica. And we see this reflected in his letter. Rather than being stamped out, this church is continuing to grow. And this is what he continues on saying in uh, verse 1. To the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The term church here... Of course, it comes from the Greek ekklesia, which literally means the ones who are called out. This had no, this term had no religious connotations at the time that, this, that Paul was writing this. It wasn't that someone read the term ekklesia and thought, oh, this is the holy gathering of Christians. Rather, it was used as an assembly. Right? So the Greeks would use this when they would gather their cities together in an assembly. And it had nothing to do necessarily with a holy meaning. However, this is why Paul gives the qualifications that he does. This isn't just some assembly. This is the assembly in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Furthermore, this church is of the Thessalonians. That is, it is made up. Of Thessalonians. The church is not a building, it is a group of individuals. The universal church is every believer everywhere without regard to space or time. And while the church is one, it does not manifest itself in one because it is limited in time and space. Right? We can't go and commune with dead Christians because we're limited by that from the scriptures. We, we can't, you know, commune with Christians from other nationalities very well because language forms a barrier between us. So what makes up a local church? Can you just sit, as I've heard some people say, right? Not anyone here. I'm not trying to accuse anyone. So if you've said this, it's not because I heard you. Okay, I, I promise. Can you? Can you just sit in a deer stand with your Christian buddy and say, you've been to church that morning? Well, I think that if you posed a question like that to Paul, he would probably scoff. To sum it up quickly, the the true church has certain marks about it. It has biblical preaching, correct doctrine. It keeps the gospel central. It has regenerate church membership. It regularly practices evangelism. It practices church discipline. It is consistent in discipleship, regular in, in administering the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. And it has godly pastors who are able to shepherd their flock. You see, the, the Thessalonian assembly is not just an austere club or an erratic cult meeting. This is an assembly... In God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to be clear here because there are several places, several buildings that brand themselves as a church. So let me give you some tests. I'm not going to go over every single one of these. But I want to give you some tests to determine, hey, is this really a church or are they just calling themselves a church? So does this thing, right, does, is claiming to be a church, does it believe the Bible is the very inerrant and infallible word of God? One of the marks of a true, or of a false, sorry, denomination is when they believe the Bible contains errors. And you can see this happening all around us nowadays with the winds of culture blowing so strong. Well, this truth right here in the Bible is kind of inconvenient. Wouldn't it be easier if we could just leave that out? 
life. But when we start to pick and choose what the Bible teaches and doesn't teaches, we are no longer a person or an individual under authority. Now we're the authority saying, oh, yeah, I know what God thinks. I get to decide what God says is true and what he says is not. And when we become the arbiter of, arbiters of truth, there is no truth any longer. These supposed mainline denominations are dying all around us. And their death is very apparent, mainly because they've rejected the word of God as being authoritative and sufficient. The next one, does the church teach glaring biblical error? The Mormons consider themselves part of a church, but they're also polytheistic. Probably one of the most polytheistic religions in the world is Mormonism. Why? Because they believe anyone could potentially become a god. If anyone could become a god, you've got more gods than even Hinduism, which is clearly denied by the teachings of the scriptures. The Jehovah's Witnesses claim to be part of a church, but they deny the divinity of Jesus Christ. They say that he is not fully God. He's a lesser God. But even in this passage, Paul is doing the exact opposite. You see the prepositional phrase here includes the preposition in, right? Describing the church. It's the church of the Thessalonians in. There's your second preposition. And then it has two persons within that one preposition. And you see Paul, even here, is putting the Lord Jesus on the same level as God the Father. And this is clearly what the Bible teaches, not just here in 1 Thessalonians 1, but all throughout the New Testament. We, you can look in John chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1, Colossians 2, 13, all of these, Philippians chapter 2, right? All these amazing Christological passages that tell us Jesus is Lord. He is God, truly God, and truly man. So let's examine another point of a biblical church, and that is biblical preaching. The question, is the main point of the text the main point of the sermon? Is the preaching designed to point you to Jesus or something else? I was just at a, a conference for pastors uh, this last Friday... Uh, hosted by Central Baptist right down the road. Uh, they had the author Jared Wilson there, and he was giving a very helpful analysis on uh, preaching. You remember back in the day when uh, women were required to never wear pants? Anyone remember those days, right? Because they, they looked at the legal code and they interpreted it a particular way, and they said, this is the interpretation Therefore, you're not allowed to do this. And this was the old legalism that was very infectious in the Southern Baptist Convention in particular. It was always, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Well, we don't really see that that much anymore, right? There's not as many. I mean, they're still out there. But there's not nearly as many legalistic churches like that. But there is a legalism of another type still lurking in our churches, instead of don't do this, it's do this, do this. Uh, Jared Wilson provided this helpful outline to how this preaching works. Number one, look for a felt need in the church. Have you ever seen, um, I don't know, the, maybe this is a pet peeve of mine, uh, but have you ever seen churches, they, they advertise their preaching series, and instead of like, we're going through the book of John right now, the preaching series is how to have successful leadership. Or um, are you dealing with money problems? Well, our preaching series is how to better your finances. Right? So the step one is to, to look for the felt need. Money, success, leadership, or marriage. And then you get a concordance and you look up the word in the Bible to find it. But maybe you formulate your points first, and that's good. You formulate your points about this thing first, then you look it up in the Bible, and you find out, oh, here's where the Bible agrees with my points. And then 
If the verses don't fit your points, you just change the Bible translation. Well, maybe the message version works better for my points. You see, this is just another form of legalism. Instead of don't do this, it's do this, do this, do this, and then you can have this. All the while, Jesus is conveniently forgotten. If you, if you leave a sermon without recognizing your deep, deep need of Jesus, it's not a biblical sermon. Why is that? It's because all of the Bible is designed to point to Jesus. Look what Jesus said to his disciples on the road to Emmaus, right at the end of the Gospel of Luke. When he expounded to them all that the scriptures, with the law, the prophets, the writings, right? All of it had to say about him. The entire Bible's designed to point us to Jesus. And this gospel message is exuding in Paul's very greeting when he says, Grace to you and peace. That's at the end of verse 1. One commentator writes this of that phrase, Grace is the source of all real blessings and peace their end and issue. In other words, the only reason we have that which is good from God is because of His grace. We don't deserve to be happy. We don't deserve to have a loving family. We don't deserve anything from God. What we deserve from God, really, is judgment. But instead, we get grace. How is this possible? Does God just sweep our sin under the rug? No. Right? It's the atoning sacrifice of Christ. Jesus died on the cross and took the punishment we deserved so God can give grace. And what's the result of this? Peace. Right? External peace. From the wrath that God had coming our way, satisfied at the cross of Christ. Internal peace. When we recognize something's wrong in here. And you want things that you know you don't need to have. And you want to be something else. You, you try to attain through legalism, right? To, to become the very thing. You can never do it on your own. But you're always striving, always striving. Trying to please God. It's never going to happen. It's this internal struggle that we experience in Christ's peace. Because, yeah, we can't do it on our own. But Jesus meets that need for us. Romans 5.1, right? Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. And thank you for the media team for putting point number one up when I didn't, I don't think, even say it. But genuine converts belong to a true church, and that was the whole point of this whole thing. Um, so hopefully you caught on to that. Uh, the second point that we see in the text is the genuine convert's behavior and attitudes are marked by faith, hope, and love. A genuine convert's behavior and attitudes are marked by faith, hope, and love. And you're probably already thinking, wait a second, isn't that from the love chapter? Faith, hope, love, these three. The greatest of these is love. Well, yeah, it's there too. And Paul was writing this letter to the Thessalonians, most likely while he was in Corinth, uh, sharing the gospel there. Look at verses uh, 2 and following of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. It says, We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. One commentator writes that the triad of faith, hope, and love is the quintessence of the God-given life in Christ. You see, conversion is largely an invisible experience. Conversion cannot be, as much as any preacher would want to, it can't be manipulated by the preacher. But conversion can be faked by the individual. Remember in John chapter 3, when Nicodemus meets Jesus, Jesus speaks of this great truth, being born again. And he compares the work of the Holy Spirit that brings about the regeneration in the person's heart 
to the wind, right? We don't see the wind, but we can feel its effects. It is blowing. We don't know where it comes from. We don't know where it goes. And so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit, right? The, the wind blows where it pleases. And so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So there is a certain mystery to regeneration. That is being born again. That we cannot explain or manipulate as much as we would like to. Christian evangelists have attempted for the past few hundred years to manipulate a person's regeneration. If you just get emotional enough, if you could just say this magic phrase called the sinner's prayer, if you could jump through a few of my evangelical hoops, then you too can be miraculously born again. Then when someone says the prayer or comes forward to the altar, hardly any counseling is done, and they're baptized into church membership. Then when they start to rebel, never show up to church again, or live a life completely contrary to the gospel, their counselor never assumes that the person might not have been saved, but rather tells them they're just backslidden. You see, in our churches, we're so consumed with the idol of numbers, get more, get more, get more, that we've made twofold sons of hell. Can't you see the major idolatry in our age? We'd rather base our salvation on some experience rather than on the Savior. I'm talking about our personal experience. How do you know you're saved? Oh, yeah, I mean, when I was eight, I said some words and I got dunked in some water. I think that means I'm saved. Rather than basing it on, I was, I was so in sin. But there is this Savior, this good Savior, who looked down at my desperate need. And though I couldn't even reach out to him, I was like a blind man groping in the dark, looking for a way out. Christ reached down to save my soul. Do you base your regeneration on an experience or on your Savior? Jesus saved you. Nothing else. You see, Paul is not remembering them because they prayed a prayer or came forward during an altar call, but rather because of three particular marks of a genuine convert, faith, hope, and love. We base our experience, certainly, primarily on our Savior. But there are external evidences that account to our regeneration. We don't know where the wind comes from. We don't know where it goes. But certainly we can see its effects. And so it is in our own lives that we should be able to see the effects of conversion. The first point there is the works of faith. And that is that work, that those actions that are now motivated by faith in God. Legalism says, do this or don't do this because it's right to do. Licentiousness says, do whatever you want because you're free in Christ. Luther noticed the behavior of a drunken man who squandered all his money on alcohol, leaving his family with nothing. And when it was time for him to uh, make up for his sins, he simply bought an indulgence which was the, at the time, really, I mean, it still goes on today, but that was the, the way that the Roman Catholics were saying, uh, yeah, your sins are covered, you just buy this um, extra merit from the saints that's provided to you from the Pope. This was not an action, a work based upon faith. Luther noticed in the same individual, when he was not motivated by his own licentiousness, his own legalism, when he was motivated by his own faith in Christ, that's when his actions began to reform. We work to make ourselves look better if we're not working in faith. All of our works are as filthy rags. You, and, I, and I just want to remind you of, of a truth that is clearly laid out for us in Scripture as we think about these works of faith. Did you know that you can't, and, and this is, sounds almost heretical, 
Did you know you, you can't disappoint God as, as if God could be shocked when you sin? You know God is unchanging. He's eternal. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows all that you're going to do. Not all that you've done, but he knows everything that you're going to do in sin. And if you're in Christ, he died for you. Despite knowing you fully, your own spouse doesn't even know you to the extent that Christ knows you. You could imagine that if one of us knew you as well as God knows you, we would probably run out of here screaming because of how wicked you are. But God knows you fully and still sent his son to die for your sins. It's not as though you mess up or you sin and then God calls a meeting and says, well, I thought you were going to be a good asset to our team, but uh, perhaps not, right? God created you in his image, and it is for you that Christ died, was buried, and rose again. It is the spirit that indwells you and sanctifies you. God does all things for your good, and it is the joy that we experience in this faith that motivates our works. So are your... Are your works motivated by faith or are they motivated by self? The next point we see in the text is the labor of love. And love is not merely an emotion or a social virtue, but rather, uh, quoting from one of the commentators, the present and continuing relationship between God and his people through Christ. In that sense... Does your actions towards God, self, and others reflect your relationship to God? The Apostle John puts it this way in uh, 1 John chapter 4. He says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and, and knows God. Anyone who does not love God does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, atoning sacrifice, the satisfaction for our sins. Beloved, here's the point that John makes. If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And this love of one another is marked by other believers. The, the alelo, the, uh, the one another is not just random people out there on the street. But how, how, what is the mark of a disciple of Christ? They will know you by your love. How can we truly express this love to one another in the church if we willfully and purposefully neglect gathering together on the Lord's day? And I'm not talking about individuals who are unable, right, for whatever providential reason to attend, but those individuals who are able to come but refuse to because some idol has gotten a hold of them. Have you ever dealt with a a stubborn toddler, I mean, uh, probably. A stubborn toddler whose favorite word is, <laughs> you got it, is no. <laughs> Picture the scene, if you will, okay? You're getting your kids ready for bed after a long day. You've dealt with all sorts of things already. You just finish up your family worship. You're there, child in bed, praying over them. And then you say, all right, come give me a hug. And the toddler talks to the arm. Probably has this. It's my kid. He has this. He has this little pout. I don't know how he gets his lips so far down, but somehow he manages to. Okay, I'm not saying that my kids have necessarily ever done this. I'm just you know picturing the scenario. They just cross their arms, and they say no. Right, and as a parent, you you might get a little heart prick from that, right? Like, oh, why? There's 
refusing to hug you is it's refusing to perpetuate that relationship between the child and the parent, right? And of course, we take into consideration, okay, this is a two-year-old. He probably doesn't really mean that he doesn't love me and that sort of thing. Right? But do you recognize the, the means that God has given us to express our love for him and fellow believers? is assembling together. When we refuse to fellowship with one another, it's as if we're the toddler. God is saying, come on, give me a hug. And we cross our arms and we say, no. What do we expect after that? Judgment? And how much grace he has given us? Is your labor marked by love? Do you find joy in displaying your relationship with God? Or is God some cold, distant star in the sky of many things that are involved in your life? Faith brings about works. Love brings about labor. And hope brings about steadfastness. This is what Philippians 1.6 says. Hope is bound up uh, with the conviction that he who has begun a good work in you, will bring it completion, to completion, um, unto the day of Christ Jesus. Hope is a word that we throw around a lot in our day. We can say that I hope the Rams win the Super Bowl, or I hope that, <laughs> no, no to that one. Uh, <laughs> we can say that I hope it doesn't rain today, right? This is not what the Bible means when it uses the phrase hope. This idea, I hope Jesus comes back, as if it might not happen, was unfathomable to the biblical authors. Hope in an all-powerful God is certain. God does mean all things for my good. God is working for my sanctification. Jesus will return and make all things right. This hope acts as an anchor that stabilizes us in our tumultuous world. The world around us, as you could probably imagine, and me, I'm only still, I'm still in my 20s, and I've seen how much the world has been changing like this, this, quick, quick, quick. The world around us is changing so fast. Things are going quickly to chaos. Our amazing Western civilization where we casted all of our hopes has been proven to be a kingdom that can be shaken. It's crumbling. There's a huge earthquake of relative truth and postmodernism that has torn us apart. How can we remain steadfast? Because our hope is in Christ. Is your hope in Christ or are you experiencing fear from the crumbling society around you? Point number three that we see in the text. Last one. And I promise we'll go through much quickly. Much quickly? Much quicker, hopefully. Uh, genuine converts, regeneration is more than an intellectual exercise. Look at verse four and the first half of verse five. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. You might be wondering, well, how? How do we know that? Well, Paul gives the answer in verse 5. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Have you seen people that treat the gospel as a mere intellectual experience? Oh, yeah, that's great. All that stuff about Jesus and him coming to the world, that sort of thing. All right, let's move on to the bigger stuff. <laughs> What about this whole salvation debate that y'all got going on? What about the, uh, the end times? Let's start talking about that. <laughs> we've, we've seen people think that we just get the gospel and then we move on from there as if the gospel is just step one on this long journey of theology. One great theologian said it this way. Christian, you can't move beyond the gospel. 
the gospel is the central truth that God wants to communicate to his children. The term euangelion was just pronounced as good news, right? This is what everyone would use during this time period to say, hey, we've won a battle. Euangelion, good news. What is the good news according to God? What is God's good news? His good news is this. You were at war with me. You, sinful, rebellious person, wanted nothing to do with me. And there's nothing inside of you that would have arose to say, yes, I want God. There's no one that seeks for God, Romans 3 says. But God demonstrated his own love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You want a summary of the gospel? Look at 1 Corinthians 15, right? We know that Christ died according to to the scriptures, that he rose again according to the scriptures, that he ascended to the Father's right hand, and that he will return. He will make all things right. See, the gospel is not just step one and then we move on from there. The gospel is what we preach to ourselves every single day. When I wake up and I feel bad about myself, and I think, I can't do this, I preach myself the gospel. Yeah, I'm not good enough, but there's a God who is. When I start to feel on my high horse, a little bit prideful, and I start going around, look, no thinking, come my way. I preach myself the gospel. I'm not good enough. But there is a God who is. Pray with me. Father, we're grateful for your truth. We're so thankful for your word. We're thankful for your gospel, Lord, that you've given to us. I pray, Lord, as we, we take these truths, that we look at the indicators of a, a genuine conversion that you would, for those who are in Christ, Lord, that you would give us the evidence that we see these things. Lord, for those who are in Christ and do not see these evidences, Lord, I pray that you would help them in their sanctification. Help them look to you in their weaknesses. I pray, Lord, for those who have believed falsely that they're in you. And they've manufactured some of these evidences. Lord, I pray that you would prick their hearts, convict them, show them their need of you. And it's only because of your son that I can pray. Amen.